So a real quick inspiration I wanted to share is that when you really look at the idea of not only a conservation land trust, but what, what might be called a community land trust, the idea for community land trusts essentially emerged in during the civil rights era in southern Georgia with a, a, an organization called New Communities Farm. It was organized in part by uh, Slater King, who was Martin Luther King Jr.'s cousin, as well as other civil rights activists in that part of Georgia, but also with a group called the Schumacher Society, which is now the Schumacher Center for New Economics, I believe, up in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. But together, they formulated a model for acquiring and stewarding land that really allowed access for people who were marginalized from owning land themselves. So it wasn't just five acres or 10 acres. This was 5,400 acres in Southern Georgia. And it was essentially bought out from white farmer owners who didn't realize they were selling to a nonprofit entity that was representing black farmers. So did for over 20 years as a, a model for land access for marginalized communities. Um, and even had, you know, different businesses operating, whether it was uh, vegetable stands or, or butcher shops for meats, things like that. Eventually, um, there were different reasons why that project did not succeed, but it did come back. And there is currently a new communities farm that was funded through one of the largest settlements against the USDA, which was, if you've heard about it, it was the Pigford case. So um, yep. for systematic discrimination against black farmers. So New Communities Farm is still active as the first community land trust. And then um, groups like the School of Living, which were started way back in the Great Depression in the 1930s, um, they actually have a community land trust that represents more of a homestead, homesteading model. So people who wanted to be more self-reliant when the economy was failing them, especially in the New York City area during the 1930s, they were building their own homes, they were cutting their own firewood, growing their own food, and it was all on land that was held collectively, essentially as a nonprofit uh, homesteading commons. And to this day, the School of Living is still active in Pennsylvania, New, uh, Maryland, and Virginia with over 600 acres of what you may, might call homesteading communities that are held as a community land trust. Um, and so they were actually our um, fiscal sponsor when we started in 2019 without having the federal 501c3 status. School of Living was generous enough to serve as our umbrella organization during those startup years. And then finally, if you look at places like Madison, Wisconsin, there's some really wonderful models of using a community land trust, which often is more for affordable housing because the affordability piece comes when a community land trust owns land, especially in a gentrifying area, and then offers people the, the ability to buy their own home, but having it separated from the value of the land, which is often driving the high price. So these are um, affordable homes built in a community outside of Madison, Wisconsin, or right on the edge of town, not only with community garden plots, not only with uh, a restored prairie, but also a community farm that produces food for that area. So really interesting example of how nonprofits can do much more than just save land and much more than just provide affordable housing. They can really provide some of these things together. Um, we know that we were inspired by the permaculture movement with group, you know, folks like Mollison and, and David Holmgren, but we also recognize that they saw permaculture as a continuation of traditional ecological knowledge from around the world and also as an adaptation to the poly crisis that we all face even more now than we ever understood back in the late 70s that between climate and between biodiversity and between social upheaval and water, there are so many responses needed with so much strategic thinking that that's what permaculture is designed to do is to adapt to those needs. Um, I did mention the farm outside of Minneapolis. Um, so this is really, you know, how that all came together real quickly is it really was a permaculture design uh, that had been put in place on a beautiful lakefront farm. And when that landowner was uh, had 
eventually made a decision. She, uh, she, she decided to gift the land, but that same land could have been sold and developed into lakefront houses. So it was a, a highly um, well thought through decision that she didn't want to see her legacy just become houses. She didn't want to just preserve the farm and call it a day. She really wanted the land tenure, the stewardship and the title to the land and the control of the land to be held by an organization that really was set up for reconnecting people of color with land that they had been marginalized from for generations. So a really nice example of how a land trust can add value and collaborate with county environmental offices and state environmental offices. And that we hope in the long term, sites like that, you'll be able to walk there with your kids or canoe down that creek. And as right. you've said, Andrew, harvest persimmons in your canoe or, or mm -hmm. pick a hickory nut off, off of a tree and share it with your children. I mean, that's all the Garden of Eden that we all live in. And we somehow forgot that we live in the Garden of Eden. Um, so without getting into detail about forest gardens, um, another reason we felt a land trust was needed was an example like this gentleman here, who is another one of those tree crop breeders and tree nurserymen uh, who spent decades selecting better edibility, or more edible varieties of native fruit and nut trees, including pecans and persimmons and pawpaws, but also a lot of hickory nuts. Um, he passed away, I think it was 2020, and you know, had wonderful plantings, groves of edible trees, really true forest gardens and genetic repositories for future forest gardens that, um, you know, his children inherited the land, but now there's this whole question of how do we work one-on-one -on -one with families like that to avoid that land just going up on the open market and becoming someone's backyard as a private property. We also know that when you look around the country, people like Zach Elfers and others who are really leaders in thinking about tree crop agriculture, they're finding that there are these uh, nurseries, there are these groves, these orchards of tree crop breeders really all over the country, but especially concentrated in the mid-Atlantic and the Northeast, somewhat in the Midwest. And when you add it up, there's probably, you know, at least 40 to 50 of these sites that really could be candidates for some level of protection since the majority of them are currently just owned as private property. And it's sites like our dear friends uh, in Southeast Pennsylvania, Dale and Carol, who've been turning their property into a forest garden for, for years and includes incredible varieties of pawpaws, many of which that they've wild harvested and, and grown from seed. Um, and, you know, as they reach their senior years, how can we provide a supporting model to them so that their homestead becomes a learning center the way it currently is. It, it's truly a place where young people come to learn permaculture. How can we continue that legacy beyond their lifetimes in a way that, that honors the plantings they've done and honors the teachings that they've done? Um, a gentleman like this in central New Jersey that I mentioned earlier with his 20 acres, how can his legacy with mulberries, with hickories, with pawpaws, live on beyond his lifetime uh, as something that doesn't become just another backyard. And, and this our, is the guy, that was the same gentleman you were saying will be able to live on the land and still be able to maintain site control, yeah, right. so to speak. But he has the assurance that when he does indeed pass away, that the land itself remains toward his vision. That's, yep. that's exactly it. And yep. frankly, Jesse, I mean, I've worked for land trusts for decades, including right in this area of the Philadelphia region. And most of them, this is not on their radar. This is not the type of property that they would pull out all the stops for in order to protect or work one on one with him to tailor uh, an outcome that he feels good about, but that also perpetuates his legacy. So that's the real kitchen table type conversations that we feel very um, pleased to be having, including sites like this one in, in the Triangle region of North Carolina, our wonderful friend Liani, who's grown a 15 year forest garden with dozens of species of native edible trees, shrubs, um, and including root, roots plants as well as herbaceous plants. 
um, she wants her site to become a learning a learning center. And so right. you're getting from the southeast to the mid-Atlantic to the northeast, suddenly you're working with different growing regions as well as different climate change potential for shifting uh, edible native and naturalized species between regions. So again, it's that idea that these are seed banks, these are cutting banks for the future. And if we really take a non-commercial approach to it, you know, these aren't going to be commercial nurseries. These are going to be places where if a riparian forest buffer gets planted on 500 acres, some of that genetics could be coming off of these sites. Or if a town park decides it wants a 20 acre community forest in the middle of a town, this these sites can provide the genetics to help plant those out. So that's what excites us about thinking this way as a land trust and and it really does extend into different growing regions, especially throughout the eastern deciduous forest that that is our native biome that we live in. So yeah, we're we're happy to be having these conversations and, and excited about it. Really nice platform from which to operate. 